Have you ever wondered what some of your root causes are for procrastination and if you could tackle those issues? That's what we'll talk about today. Procrastination is the grave in which opportunity is buried. Unknown source. I'm sure the person who wrote that meant to put their name down on the paper, but probably just procrastinated it. Today we're going to talk about procrastination and a book or an essay that helped me a great deal, primarily because it taught me why I was procrastinating or what was really going on. And once I understood it, then I was able to start tackling what was going wrong. It's a bit like how I solved my sleeping problem. First, I had to identify the problem, and then I tackled the problems one by one. This book is called The Art of Procrastination, A Guide to Effective Dawdling, Lollygagging, and Postponing by John Perry. This started out as an essay. He's a Stanford professor of philosophy, and he noticed that he was what he calls a structured procrastinator. I didn't have high hopes for the book. I don't know why when I first bought it. First of all, the book is very short. If you listen to it on audio, it takes about an hour and a half to get through it. But I was wrong in dismissing how it could help me. He says that we try to satisfy our desires, you know, to get thin, do our job well so we get promoted or get recognized. And we think that we are rational agents. But he said that it's rational agents built up with a lot of things. Sure, there's a rational agent in there who decides what the next best thing to do is and then goes and does it. And some people, like my best friend, she's great at that. Me, I'm terrible at that. I don't know why it was. And for my whole life, I couldn't figure out what was going on. But he said in the end, most of us who are procrastinators actually operate quite fine. We get through our lives. And the problem in the beginning he talks about is that people feel terrible about being procrastinators. They feel like they're lazy. They can't get anything done. They can't get the goals they want. Other people think poorly of them. They get guilted into it. My grandmother was big about this. I think she thought I was smart and that I could figure things out. But because I was such a procrastinator, she worried about whether my life would turn out at all. And in this sense, when he came up with this theory of the structured procrastinator, it made him feel better. And it made me feel better, but not in a feel-good, pat-yourself-on-the-back way, but on a, oh, this is the actual problem. This is how I can solve it. It is definitely something that I've seen in myself. And he said it's funny because we can get a lot of things done. Even when I was at the worst in my procrastination, I got a ton of things done. I was active all the time. The problem is, is the things I got done were not the things that were the most important thing to do, the thing that I really needed to do, the thing that other people expected me to do or were waiting for me to do. And so it made other people think less of me. It made me think less of me. And I never really got what I wanted to get in life. He says a couple of things is true about the structured procrastinator is that we can get anything done as long as it's not actually the job that we meant to do or the most important thing to do. He says that if he has a paper he's supposed to review, maybe the student is looking to go on to a postdoctorate career, trying to get written up in a notable journal, and so they're looking for an endorsement from him. That's the most important thing he has to do. So he may look at the paper. Oh, man, my chair is really uncomfortable. I should go order a new chair. Then he spends the rest of the day investigating new chairs. And then he looks at the bolt underneath the chair, gets his tools out, maybe starts to fix it up. That's not his example, but you can see where this is going. That was me, too. I get off track all the time where you think, I'm going to do this today. And suddenly you're in this wormhole, my friend and I call it, you end up in the basement. Because if you ever decide to clean your house, I'm going to clean my kitchen and eventually you have all this stuff. And then you decide you're going to take this thing and put it in the basement for now because you don't really want it in your kitchen. And then suddenly you see your basement and you start organizing your basement. And the thing you were originally meaning to do now never gets done. That's a little bit of what he's talking about. If we think the most important thing is to do X, 
we'll figure out 13 different ways never to get to X. Not that we didn't intend to do it, but look at all these things that just popped up out of the blue. It also doesn't mean we don't get things done. He says we definitely get things done. He said that there'd be times where he would try to work on something back in the pencil and paper day, and suddenly he would find out he had a bunch of pencils that he found, and then he was sat there sharpening them for hours. It wasn't that he was intending to not do the thing he was trying to do, but for whatever reason, whatever task is most important, that is the thing you procrastinate with. And then maybe he'll send an email. Oh, sorry, I didn't get to your thing today. Which is another way of avoiding the task. Maybe the email even took as long as it would have just done to write the review. But now he's apologizing for not writing the review, which is another task that took him off course. If he's looking to do some research, and this was big for me too, he'll spend all day looking for the right books to investigate this topic. When I was in college, I mentioned this before, if I had a paper to do, I would look through the library to find every one of the best books on this topic, maybe 30 of them. And I'd bring them all to the table after I found them in the stacks. And I would look through them one by one until I found maybe the top five best books. Check those out, bring them home. Then I would read those books and then I would work on my paper. Made for great papers, maybe, because maybe I started so late on my paper it ended up bad. Maybe it wasn't very well written. Maybe it wasn't very well thought out. You know, if I had more time, I would have thought it out better. But boy, I procrastinated by doing the task in the most ineffective way possible. And then he says, I will eventually do the task I was trying to do once it stops becoming the most important task I need to do. So suddenly, he says, I have to decide which textbooks we're going to read in his class the next season. And he says, then I'll write that review on that student's paper, because now it's no longer the most important task on his list. Ordering the books is the most important task. And so now he's procrastinating on a new task by doing the task he should have been doing for. He says that part of it, too, has to do with perfectionism. And I didn't think that of myself. I didn't think I was a perfectionist. If pretty type B and pretty laid back. I'm easygoing with things. But he made me realize that this is absolutely true. When I wanted to write papers in college or when I wanted to start this podcast, I wanted it to be perfect. And I would nudge it and work on it, you know, but then I was be scared. I'd get scared at some point that I wasn't able to do the most perfect job with it. And then I would spin. I wouldn't even start working on it because it suddenly became clear to me I wasn't going to do a perfect job. So then instead of not doing a perfect job, I just procrastinated on it. And then when it became due or I had to get it done, I suddenly had to do a rush job because now I'm out of time. And then when I got the paper back and it was like a B minus, I'd say, well, that's because I did it at the last minute. I didn't have enough time to get this done properly. Now, not only am I a perfectionist, but now I have a good excuse so I don't feel bad about myself about why my perfectionism didn't work out. When I heard that line in this book, I'm like, oh, and this was a key message that this book taught me. He says that we never do anything perfect. It's a fantasy of doing things perfect in the first place, that if you have the perfect research, the perfect everything, you will do a great job. And then you try to set up your home so it's perfectly set up so that you can concentrate. And then you have to do this. And now I better eat. And oh, look at the lawn. It needs mowing. And you're just putting it off, putting it off. And then when you're disappointed, you say, well, you know, I could have done a better job, but, you know, the fates were against me. At some point, he says that you start realizing that you're not coming through affects other people. Maybe that student he had that needed the review of his paper, his career, his a scholarship or something like that would get effective. Is there a way we can do this without having less stress and, and make other people happier with us? So the first thing he suggests, besides getting away from the perfectionism and reading good books about how to stop being so perfectionist and caring about the lack of perfection in things, we will never be perfect. So spending the time and the mental energy to try to be perfect, it's not going to happen. Of course, we want to do a good job, but it's never going to be perfect. 
He said the next thing we do is what he calls task triage, which sounds familiar. We'll analyze it. We'll look at all the different tasks and put them in a priority list. He says there's a lot of good apps out there or pieces of paper, and they can help us. But just be careful because this task analysis could cause us to sit there and procrastinate as we spend a good deal of time of analyzing our tasks and putting them in the proper software. Whoops, wait, I have to go find the perfect software. Okay, now I've looked at seven of them and found the perfect software. Now I'm gonna type my list in. Ooh, do I wanna use this font or do I wanna use the other font? And go just off the rails on trying to get these tasks perfect too. So don't let it be a stumbling point for you, a new thing to avoid actually doing anything. And he says some of these tasks may be, you know, something that we have to do within days, weeks, or our entire life. It's a big lifetime goal. What he suggests is that we create tasks that are very simple and we can check them off. He mentions getting up, not going back to bed, brushing your teeth, drinking your first cup of coffee. He says that when he does his very first task of the day, he's already accomplished a dozen smaller tasks, and now he gives himself a pat on the back because he got those things done. He feels the real purpose of task lists are to provide us with a happy thing. Look at all the things I'm getting done. He mentions in the essay that a problem with some of the software, like Outlook and some others, when you cross off a task, it goes away. Now, most of those task managements will let you look at your accomplished tasks so you can see what it is you got done. And Todoist, which is the task management system after I procrastinated many, many things to find the perfect piece of software, helped me to see all the things I got done. It has nice little charts and things like that, too, to help you see what you got done. I think it's great. But he says that once you've done that, now it's about taking the rest of your tasks and guess what? Start with small steps. He gives a quote from Robert Maurer that we accomplish more by doing less, meaning it's a series of small tasks. He then talks about the book from Anne Lamott, Bird by Bird, where a kid was panicked about writing a report on the bird and father said, son, just take it bird by bird, meaning start with small steps. Just take the first step, take the next step, go bird by bird, don't get panicked about it. So he mentioned how that system just helps us get things done. And just because we have a thought of what we should do, it might not be the reality of what we should do. He said that we should perhaps create a don't list. Don't do these things. Don't do this other thing. Don't load up Twitter. Don't drink that fourth can of Diet Coke. He says then he'll start in the paper. Oh, look, a movie. Oh, Meg Ryan's in it. And then suddenly he'll start looking up everyone in the movie. Boy, that's my rabbit hole too. I love looking up facts about anything I see. Oh, look at that bird go about. I wonder what crows are really like. He says that we have to use what he calls self-manipulation to get into the rhythm. That we have songs that lift us up. He says a lot of times this type of procrastination goes hand in hand with depression. So maybe we need something that makes us happy. Or ways of feeling less sad. Or we just feel like something to dance around and get excited and get energized by. He said that sometimes when you wake up low, an upbeat song can really help you get going in your morning. Make a playlist even. And then when you make a playlist, you can make certain playlists like this is the playlist I like to listen to when I'm cleaning the house. This is the playlist I have when I'm trying to concentrate and work on a paper. Believe it or not, I have those playlists. And believe it or not, it's also a fantastic way of procrastinating on your task. Building playlists are time-consuming and enjoyable. He says computers can help or hurt. They end up being kind of a simulation of what our desk is like. He says back in the day, you'd have a desk and it would have piles all over it. And the newer, more important stuff would end up closer to you. And the older stuff, maybe just as important, would start falling off the back. And eventually it would get so far to the back of the desk in these stacks that eventually they would just fall off the desk entirely. Ah, accomplished. They're no longer on the desk. But... If we have computers, I've seen people's desktops, and I think we have a new form of clutter, a new form of hoarding, digital clutter. 
it can be just as bad, if not even worse. Because if you fill your house, at some point you feel bad and you feel embarrassed and so you clean it up. But with digital hoarding, there's no reason to. It's your secret private place, the computer only you log into, and you can use endless folders and files. You can even buy storage devices that can hold terabytes of files. So it could get out of control just as much with a digital system as it does with a paper system. And he said that there are other ways of organizing things that people try, but it tends to fail, and it tends to fail for me. He says if you send it back quickly, they'll get amazed, but they'll also start expecting you to send back things quickly, and maybe now you'll start feeling guilty if you don't. He said that there was times, too, that you could create a folder of things that were important and flag emails and do all these things to highlight them to make sure you don't miss them. And I've tried those systems. I used to have a work email I called important. And guess what? Everything I shoved in there, I entirely ignored. I learned the lesson that if it wasn't in my inbox, I was not going to pay attention to it. Same thing, like when I had a desk with papers on it, if it wasn't on my desk and right in front of me and it fell to the floor, I was never going to see it again. If it goes into a filing system, it is gone forever. I was been working on my basement lately and cleaning it out. You know, I have a file cabinet down there, and you know what it has? Articles from like 1990. What am I doing with articles from 1990 anywhere in my house? So I'm going through them and getting rid of them. Because I never once looked at it again. I filed it away. I had an amazing organization system, which was a perfect place to bury anything I never wanted to see again, much like my important folder in my inbox. Now what I do is everything that needs to be responded to is in my inbox. And if something is not important or FYI, I put it in a folder and then I never see it again because it wasn't important and it's just an FYI. Then if I have to dig it out again for some reason, I can find it in there. Everything that's important is stays in my inbox, and I try to keep my inbox empty. Because if I don't, I'll never get anything done because I'll never see it again because it'll start falling to the bottom. He says that even with the digital age, we feel a little bit worse about procrastinating than we used to because it used to be with slow email. Oh, well, if I send this in the mail today, they're not going to get it for four days anyway. So even if I delay it for a couple of days. Doesn't matter. Just blame the mail system. You know, that was always the thing. You could send in bills late and then just call the credit card companies and say, well, I don't know, mail must be slow. You felt less urged to get things done. But now with email being instant, you're suddenly pushed into responding to people right away because they'll know when you did. And as soon as you do respond to an email, they hit it back into your court. I used to work for a company that talked about bad habits of pretending like work was like tennis. I'm just going to hit it back into your court so I can get it out of my court. Whoops, now it just came back again. It doesn't really solve the problem, and all you're doing is postponing something by just knocking it back into their court. All right, so my challenge to you is take a look at your own procrastination. Are any of these reasons some of the root causes of what makes your procrastination worse. Are you a perfectionist? Do you have depression problems? Are you just disorganized and you can't find anything? Or are you spending too much of your time doing other things? Try to think for you, what causes you to procrastinate on projects? Maybe just identifying the problem will help you find solutions. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have other podcasts and other podcasts coming. You can find out more at thecuriousgals.com. My friend is the other curious gal, and together we just want to know how the world works and how we can make ourselves and other people have happier lives. So we're the curious gals, and you can find out more about our other podcasts there. Please remember that walking down that road towards getting things done begins with small steps. <laughs>